Uh, this is um, a conference that is part of a conference series um, that I have organized uh, in the uh, Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in collaboration with the Global Governance Center and the Center for International Environmental Studies. Um, it's part of a series of, of conferences on the polar regions. The first two conferences have focused on the Antarctic. The first was on the geopolitics of the Antarctic, who owns the Antarctic. And the second was on environmental protection in the Antarctic. And this is the third of those, uh, of those conferences. And we will now today be looking at the Arctic. All of these conferences are recorded um, and they go on the Graduate Institute's website and on its YouTube channel uh, for future viewership. Um, it is my pleasure today to welcome uh, our panel. Two of our speakers are yet to join. Um, so far we have with us, um, we have Abby Tinkstad, Associate Director, Management, Technology and Capabilities Program, RAND Homeland Security Research Division, and she'll be speaking to us about the militarization of the Arctic and NATO expansion. We have Mads Fredrickson with us, who is Executive Director of the Arctic Economic Council, and he will be speaking to us about the future of economic cooperation in the Arctic. And we have Timo Koivurova with us. Hello, research professor at the Arctic Center, University of Lapland. And he will be talking to us about Russia and the suspension of the Arctic Council. We are missing two of, our, two, uh, two of the other speakers who hopefully will be joining uh, with a bit of a delay, with only a bit of a delay. Um, now, uh, for uh, this conference, which is entitled Conceptualizing the Arctic, a Zone or of Peace or a Zone of Conflict, I hope uh, that all participants who are here with us will be very active. Uh, please feel free to send your questions uh, on the chat of this WebEx platform, and I will be going through them. So please send your questions in. Uh, in writing instead of raising your hand, since I may not see the raise hand uh, function of this platform. Um, I also know that a lot of my students who will be watching this will be sending questions in to my email, which is also fine. Um, a few words of introduction to this topic. Clearly, um, Clearly, the politics of the Arctic are heating up. Uh, the politics of the entire planet are heating up. We have, uh, we not only have uh, an incredible climate crisis, which is also a political crisis, uh, but we also have a war right in the heart of Europe. Um, so we are currently in a, in a complex geopolitical situation um, at the global level, which is having a tremendous impact on the Arctic, a part of the world that very few people are talking about in the context of these multiple crises, whereas it actually needs to be front and center of what we discuss. Why so? First of all, because the Arctic is the fastest warming part of our planet. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is melting at a speed uh, that goes beyond what anybody would have anticipated. It is opening up. There are um, its resources. The Arctic Ocean's resources are becoming more accessible. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is the smallest and shallowest of the world's oceans, um, and so it does have the most accessible um, seabed, if you will. But there are also new sea routes that are opening up, um, whether on along the Russian coastline or along the Canadian coastline, that may transform uh, international trade and shipping. Um, so. Climate change is right at the heart of what is happening in the Arctic, but in addition, uh, Russia is half the Arctic, um, and so the current, uh, the current war that is taking place between Russia and Ukraine has tremendous implications for the Arctic, where Russia may soon be surrounded by uh, countries that are all entirely NATO members. Um, so. You know, what are we to make of these developments? Um, uh, what, uh, what do these developments imply for the Arctic? Will the Arctic remain a zone of peace uh, or will it become a zone of conflict? This is what we'll be exploring in today's um, conversation with our very distinguished panel. Uh, I would like to start by giving the floor, um, if I may, 
to um, to Timo Koivorova, uh, and I'd like you to talk to us about Russia and the suspension of the Arctic Council and what all this means. You have about eight to ten minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Uh, now from Kobe, Japan. It's quite late in the in the evening here. Currently a visiting professor here. <clears throat> So I'm going to be talking about the Arctic Council and um, like, like also a little bit from the, the kind of historical perspective so that we can understand um, to where we are currently. So I will, I'll start with the background and, and move further in a, in a, in a slight kind of chrono, chronological order and, and then I will arrive at, at, at today. So first of all, some background of the Arctic Council Corporation. So the actual Arctic Council was established in 1996, um, but already before that, there was a fin Finnish initiative called the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy that uh, was concluded in 1991 already. And there already the, the eight Arctic states at the time, Soviet Union, uh, USA, Canada, and the five Nordic states were able to uh, conclude kind of intergovernmental cooperation uh, format. And then this was kind of gradually developed into, um, or this kind of morphed into the Arctic Council uh, in 1996. And gradually this Arctic Council has, has done very many kind of ambitious um, governance endeavors uh, over the years. And I would say until to the year 2014 in, in particular. Important to understand that the Arctic Council has a very unique place for indigenous people's organizations. So they are permanent, uh, permanent participants in the, in the Arctic Council. So they are sitting at the same tables than the, the state representatives. And also that the interest in Arctic affairs was growing very fast. So, so now there is a, a 38 observers to the Arctic Council of which 13 are non-Arctic states, countries like China and India. So then we enter the era of, of more and more difficulties. Uh, so this this become this comes um, or 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 is kind of unfolding with the with the Russian invasion, uh, Russian annexation of of Crimea in in 2014, um, uh, Russia supporting the East Ukraine war. So these are also even if the Arctic Council is able to to continue with with some hiccups. Um, it is it, it is continuing in such a way that uh, the the security forms are are being kind of gradually um, terminated in terms of it of their cooperation with Russia. So uh, Arctic chiefs chiefs of of defense meetings ended with the Crimean annexation, and also Russia withdrew from the so-called Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. Of course, the Western countries also sanctioned Russia. Uh, already back in, in 2014 and Russia then uh, counter sanctioned. But it's important and interesting that that international cooperation continued uh, even with this diff difficult uh, geopolitical um, uh, situation that we were, we were facing at the time. So 2015 Arctic Coast Guard Forum was established uh, uh, a science agreement was signed between the eight Arctic states in 2017. Um, uh, the Arctic states were cr cr crucial players when the International Maritime Organization was able to, to have its polar code enter into force in 2017. Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement was concluded in 2018. And all these processes are, are such where, where Russia has played a major role. And at the same time, um, after the 2014, gradually, we have also, of course, witnessed that Russia has been restoring its military might also in its uh, Arctic regions. And, and we have kind of gradually also seen that the NATO is, is building its presence in the high north. So both of these, Russia and NATO, having uh, more and more stronger military presence in Barents and Norwegian seas, both having also a lot of military exercises, many times one following after the other. Still, 
Um, again, this this was the, I think the second time the Arctic Council was nominated as a as a candidate for for Nobel Peace Prize at the beginning of February 2024, 2022, just before the invasion on uh, uh, 24th of February. And this was kind of a final drop in, in this kind of chain of events that, that then made it increasingly difficult to tackle jointly the Arctic problems and pretty much halted a lot of Arctic cooperation. And I will, I will tell um, approximately what. So we did a report to our government. We just released it about um, one and a half months ago. Um, and we were kind of looking into what is still left in terms of uh, cooperation, non-governmental and governmental cooperation in the Arctic. Russia is still very much participating in, in those global governance processes, which are very important from the future, from the viewpoint of the future of the Arctic. So it is, um, it is all the time participating in the, the climate regime. It is participating in the work of the IMO, et cetera. It also participates in legal cooperation in the in the regional level, like the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, and also Finland and Norway bilaterally they are cooperating all the time with with um, um, Russia, search and rescue fisheries, trans frontier river management. Not really like you know over overly kind of a, a strong cooperation, but but. Um, these things need uh, to be addressed one way or the other, and they are being managed together. Soft law cooperation forums, such as the Barents Euroarctic Council, um, that was suspended. The, the cooperation with Russia was suspended, and most non-governmental Arctic cooperation is now in a halt. Uh, not all, but most. Um, uh, so, so that's a pretty complete, um, complete pause. For well, the Arctic Council, this is what has taken place. So, from the beginning of March 2000, well, well this year, the seven uh, Western Arctic states withdrew their own cooperation from the Arctic Council that was chaired by Russia, and Russia still nominally continues as as the chair of of the Arctic Council. Russia has not been suspended. That this is important to make 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 clear. They also emphasized in the same statement that. Um, they are very much still committed to the Arctic Council of Cooperation. I think this is worth um, repeating. Then in June uh, this year, these same seven states resumed uh, about 70 projects. Uh, there are about 130 projects going on in the Arctic Council in its working groups. Um, and only those where Russians are not participating. Um, and again, they said in this statement that they are still very much committed to the Arctic Council cooperation as it is. Currently, we know that Norway is preparing to receive a chairmanship sometime in the spring of 2023. So where to go from here, some speculation. Of course, we are all speculating a lot because so many things are uncertain. Um, we know that there are lots of obstacles to starting the Arctic Council cooperation. So we have a situation where Russia would, according to the rules of procedure, would need to organize the ministerial meeting. And then with that, there would be a transition to Norwegian chairmanship. We know that this is not possible to do in the current circumstances, but we also are aware that there are various other plans how this transition could take place. So it is possible that the Arctic Council cooperation continues. So we just don't know. There are many question marks because of the, the war raging. We know that, that the, the escalation uh, uh, possibilities, etc. So many things remain uncertain. We also know about the, the changes in the hard security landscape that Finland and Sweden are very likely accessing NATO. And then we will have a, a situation where uh, uh, the Arctic states are seven NATO members and, and Russia, which of course makes it difficult to think that the international cooperation in the Arctic, at least in the, in the foreseeable future, can be very ambitious. So a couple of words for conclusion. So in my view, we cannot just say that everything changed with the invasion. Uh, many things change. 
but but I think that we have to kind of kind of um, acknowledge that these have been deteriorating already from 2014 onwards. This was a kind of final drop, but it, of course, a um, lot of the cooperation in the region did vanish, at least temporarily. And currently we are waiting how the chairmanship transition can be done. And many of us are still hoping that the Arctic Council can continue. It does enormously important work in, in, in many areas, but it is at the moment very difficult to see that very ambitious cooperation could be done in the Arctic or in the Arctic Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Timo, for that. Um, so, uh, the Arctic is one of the regions where, uh, you know, th that has been dealt a serious blow by current global events because of what's happened uh, to the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council for um, for uh, viewers on this call who may not be familiar with all the details, the Arctic Council is the loose sort of intergovernmental forum um, uh, that governs the Arctic. Um, and that forum was supposed to be under Russian chairmanship uh, this year. And of course, its work got suspended in light of current events. So it's one of the regions uh, of this world that, is, um, uh, that has felt the immediate impact that, uh, of, of current geopolitical developments. Now, um, as you said, Timo, of course, the Arctic Council played a, a crucial role and it has had many successes. But now we have to see what is left of that council, how we organize succession, possibly to pass the chairmanship on to someone else. Um, I think you've made some very important points about Russia not having been suspended. It's the council that is for now suspended. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you've said that, uh, you know, Arctic uh, uh, nations are still very committed to the Arctic Council. So that's also very important. Uh, I will come back to you with a lot of questions, and I'm sure viewers will have a lot of questions too. But Abby, I will now move to you for your presentation on uh, the militarization of the Arctic and NATO expansion. Over to you, Abby. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be part of this esteemed panel and to be uh, looking forward to some questions with the audience as well. So I'll just start by noting that for many years, the Arctic has been discussed as an area of high cooperation and low tensions or some variation of that phrase. And that really isn't how I would describe the region today as we've been, we've been talking about. That all being said, however, um, I'm going to argue that although we haven't exactly been here before, the idea of how things are currently playing out from a military perspective isn't exactly novel. It, it's something that has been thought of before. And in, in some cases, I think countries have been preparing for this sort of an outcome or sort of a trajectory, um, even if it's um, not particularly one that I think in previous years or recent years would have been the desired trajectory, if you will. Certainly there's a lot of uncertainty um, happening right now, as has already been mentioned and a heightened focus on military capabilities and their role and potential growth in the region. I'll note, of course, that the northern part of the world hasn't historically been devoid of tensions, nor is it devoid now of all cooperation. And I think um, uh, that uh, my colleague on this panel, um, Timo Koiburova, just provided some very good remarks on this, highlighting that you know, there are there is some still basis for cooperation in the region. I think we may hear more uh, soon, uh, hopefully about economic cooperation, um, but certainly it, it does not look the same as it did uh, even a year ago, of course, and we, we need to um, pay attention to that. I will also take a bit of a historical perspective to start. I think it's really important to understand uh, what kind of a trajectory we are on in the Arctic and not just think about the current moment um, is a good way of, of thinking about where the future might be going and what some of the factors are that would influence the direction of that future. So uh, even immediately post Cold War, if I can go, go back at least, at least to that stage, uh, the region wasn't, you know, devoid of military activity. I think a lot of people would argue that immediately post Cold War was one of the you know, least least tense uh, moments in the Arctic, at least from a hard security perspective. 
But of course, even then, it um, it is not as if the military simply just left the region, although we did uh, generally see um, a decreasing presence and perhaps letting some of that infrastructure in the region um, not be kept up, uh, which a, a trend that has changed, I think, in in, uh, in recent years, um, as uh, we have we've already heard a little bit about. And then another uh, period of note, I think, is uh, circa around 2007, um, when in the news media we started hearing an amplification um, of possible resource wars. And I, I think this was also supported with by, you know, some discussions and speculations and more of the policy community as well. And not, not without cause. We definitely saw, for example, I think perhaps most famously, the planting of the Russian flag. Um, in the vicinity of the North Pole and the seabed by the by the submarine that was very well publicized. Th these sorts of um, messages, I think, were were quite amplified and did cause some some reasonable concern, which um, resulted in people taking a, a good look at you know which resources in the Arctic might be contested. Which um, I guess if you expand the definition of resources, you might also consider things like waterways and control of waterways, and how contested they they might be. Uh, is another very important discussion area here. And I, I think on balance where the community of stakeholders landed is that yes, certainly um, important issues and yes, certainly uh, militaries uh, and military presence are, are notable um, in these contexts, but by and large, the uh, thought of having an all out resource war in the Arctic for um, uh, oil or natural gas or, or lumber or fish, um, and any of these things was was deemed to be very, very un unlikely because of the strong governance structures in the Arctic, and frankly, because quite a few of the Arctic's resources are um, not debated, at least in in broader policy circles, about who who could can control them potentially um, or exploit exploit them. But uh, what we did see in that same um, discussion period was a uh, focus um, also on uh, some other types of scenarios that might be have more plausible concern when it comes to military presence. One of those was that related to a geostrategic spillover. And we'll return to that because I think that's really one of the trajectories that we are concerned with today in a much more concrete fashion. Um, and then also unintended escalation following miscommunication and accident or similar, which I also um, think is an area that people are continuing to think about today with some concern. But I'll continue for just a moment again with uh, some history. Uh, 2011 was another notable year because of the um, search and rescue agreement that was signed through the auspices of the Arctic Council. Uh, and the reason I mention this is because it did in part at least motivate um, some thoughts of reconstructing revitalizing military infrastructure and capabilities in the Arctic because of the uh, uh, potential for dual use of those capabilities, as we've seen very quite, I think, uh, we observe potentially, on, certainly with Russia, um, and um, also noting that other Arctic countries do, some of them at least, do see their militaries as being potential first responders in the region. Um, so we return to the military, I think, conversation with that as well. Uh, and then certainly post 2014, um, we saw growing concern and growing in consideration of what NATO's role, if any, um, as an alliance in the region should be. And this, of course, was not not unexpected with the um, uh, with the growth of, of tensions and um, and the uh, annexation of Crimea. And now, of course, in February of this year, we had a uh, I would consider a, a flag thrown. Um, when we saw the um, intensification of the in invasion of, of Ukraine. So where does this leave us now? Um, well, I think we can we can argue at least that we, the possible geostrategic spill scenario is starting to play out a little closer to home. Now, I'm not suggesting that we are in the midst of about to start an Arctic conflict or of any kind, but it is definitely the build up to that scenario that some analysts have outlined over the past 20 years or so um, that we we are seeing some things that are quite similar to the scenarios that people have been discussed that, you know, some of which then end in a, a spill scenario of concern. So right now we're definitely seeing um, northern NATO countries looking at what revitalization needs are in the north for their militaries. Um, certainly a, a big emphasis on interoperability um, 
and uh, both in the technical sense um, as well as in the operational sense. Um, for example, I think very notable was the um, uh, recent decisions about fifth generation fighter jets. Um, Finland, Canada, um, among others, Norway also shares some of that interoperability with the United States. And then also the importance of communications and sensing, um, including through some space cooperation. The US is uh, in particular weighing, I think, starting to weigh its broader presence around the world with uh, uh, potential for a deeper commitment to resources to Alaska, Tula, and elsewhere in the high north. Now, um, I don't represent any opinions of the US government, of course, but um, I do think that there have been some increased discussions and we'll see where those go. Um, Naturally, the um, the potential NATO mem membership of Finland and Sweden would make seven of eight Arctic countries NATO members more overtly have a this northern flank, if you will, of NATO. But I think we should also note that NATO is a much broader organization than um, the uh, five or seven Arctic states that, um, that that could be members of it. So a broader conversation there as well. We have seen over the past few years, Russia expanding and increasing exercises um, more over cooperation with China. We have seen mysterious communications and other disruptions. We've seen carefully messaged narratives in the in the media. Um, and uh, we've seen continued and in some ways increasing interest from China in the region. So all, all ML elements of certain scenarios that had have previously been discussed from a military perspective in the Arctic. So to close, I'll just talk a little bit about moving forward. So I think there's a lot of questions for Arctic countries on prioritization. Um, from recent communications from, from Russia um, this year. I think uh, Russia's plans and doctrines make it clear that Russia is continuing to very much prioritize the Arctic, a lot of focus on Arctic capabilities, though at the same time, we would expect that just given Russia's geography in the Arctic. Um, the geography of Russia and the Arctic, its large geography, if you will, also brings with it a lot of issues, um, such as permafrost impacts on, on infrastructure. Um, I read a recent article that was focused on uh, potential NATO capabilities in, in the Arctic that noticed that noted the issue of having to re revitalize infrastructure impacted by permafrost and other environmental impacts, which is true. And NATO countries um, such as the US and Canada and the Nordic countries um, that are currently members of NATO would also experience potentially these sorts of issues in areas where there is permafrost, for example. However, um, I would note that Russia with a larger Arctic area and more Arctic infrastructure in some cases um, also experiences such problems, perhaps to a much higher degree, simply because it, it has more geography in the region. So I think an issue that countries share in, in the in the region. Um, and with respect to Russia, also, you know, we're seeing activity in Ukraine um, that has caused some uh, Western analysts to pause and say, you know, maybe maybe Russia was not as capable in some cases as as had been previously thought. So I think more to come on that. Um, Nordic country capabilities, of course, have been historically consistent with the need to operate in the Arctic, also by virtue of geography. I think there's some questions, um, for example, from the North American part of the Arctic about whether increased cooperation, even beyond what is currently done with Nordic countries, could be um, beneficial also for lessons in the North American Arctic, which I'll notice, I'll note is quite different than the, than the Nordic part of the Arctic, but still some good lessons um, perhaps to be learned. Um, and then again, the question uh, for the US, I think, is how will the Arctic fall among the US's other important priorities? Finally, the importance of sensing and communication to avoid miscalculation, I think, is increasingly important, maybe even, even more so um, than ever since the uh, end of the Cold War. Um, we're seeing the prevalence of the information domain very much, I think, in the Arctic region. So I think more thoughts and consideration on that and how that intersects with military cap capabilities, the potential for miscalculation or unintended escalation is quite important. And then uh, managing diplomacy on Arctic issues with China and maybe other observer states. I don't want to make it seem like China is the only Arctic Council observer. Um, certainly tensions have been rising with combining China and Russia in discussions about the Arctic. Um, those of us who were at the Arctic Circle Assembly in October saw a very interesting exchange. Um, between a NATO representative and um, the um, the Chinese ambassador to, to Iceland, very much to this point of why are we lumping China in with Russia in the Arctic? An open question, perhaps. 
Um, and then even absent full Arctic Council activities, there are still many forms in which Arctic observer and otherwise interested states can participate on decisions that impact um, the Arctic. So I think more to see and to come there as well. I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. Uh, what a what an excellent expose of the situation uh, in the Arctic. Um, I think very eye opening. And as you mentioned them in the beginning, uh, I don't think we are looking at the same Arctic anymore. Um, it was for many years characterized as a low tension zone. Clearly, uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, but the extent of the change, the extent of its significance, its implications, all of that is a bit of a wait and see. Um, I will come back to you with many questions, and I'm sure viewers will have questions as well. Um, just to remind uh, people who have joined after I made my uh, introductory comments, please send your questions in the chat. Um, Matt, I'd like to <clears throat> hand over the floor to you now. Um, to talk to us about the future of economic cooperation in the Arctic. We've spoken about, uh, Timo has spoken to us about the suspension of the Arctic Council, Abby, the militarization of the Arctic. Is there a positive story on your side about collaboration, uh, about economic growth, about economic opportunity in the Arctic? Over to you. Thank you, Doan. I will probably be the most positive of the speakers so far, uh, which I actually think is good because uh, I, I'm sitting here in Tromsø in the Arctic region right now, and I look outside of my door and I see a, a lively Christmas community of people walking around and having a, a nice time in, in northern Norway in, in the winter season. And I don't see fear and panic and escalation, and I definitely don't see a post uh, Post Trumpser, I see a very lively Trumpser with a lot of business activities. So uh, I, I think it's it's always I think the two speakers are obviously exceptionally smart and bright people and know their topic. Uh, and and I but I think as anywhere else in the world, there is a million sides to to every story. And and my side will be from the from the business side. Um, so the overall headline for my speak is the state of the Arctic. A co a cooperation is healthy but challenged. Um, so it's definitely not paused because you cannot pause this economic development. It's, uh, it's actually still going strong with some of the development we see, but it's obviously challenged for, from, the, from the reasons we heard from the two speakers. Um, the region has what the world needs uh, when it comes to raw materials, as we heard, but when it also when it comes to energy, when it comes to food and a lot of other things. And this is not a new thing. So the previous two speakers gave us a, a, a like a, a brief uh, historical explanation going back, you know, Cold War, going back 25 years. I would like to go back 1500 years and say, you know, the Vikings in the year 700 were already trading uh, a lot in the Arctic. So you got Vikings going from North Norway, from Denmark, going up to Iceland, going to Greenland, going to the US. And actually, there was with an interest in trading. You also got uh, later, you got well bladder in the, in the street lands of Paris and Berlin. That was well bladder from, from Northern Greenland that was used there. So, so the Arctic community has always been a part of a global uh, value chain and a global cooperation, but in more and less speeds, uh, yeah, and more and less tempi uh, as we go along. But I just want to briefly just give you an instruction to the AEC, the Arctic Economic Council, because a lot of you maybe not don't know what we do. Um, and, and then also a little bit about the Arctic and then finally about the economic cooperation. So the AEC, the Arctic Economic Council, established by the Arctic Council, uh, in 2014, but we are completely independent. So we are we are we are an organization, a business membership organization, paid for by private sector industries in the Arctic region, and also with members from outside the Arctic region that has an interest in Arctic investments. So we we really represent the people that develop the jobs. We represent the people living in the Arctic and people that operates in the Arctic, and also outsiders who has an interest in the Arctic. And thank God for that, that that actually exists, because I actually think it's positive that the world is lo looking north. It would be a, a scary story if we have this isolation of a national park in the north. Um, a little bit about the Arctic. You know, e economic cooperation in the Arctic happens on many different levels. I think an, an interesting 
an interesting case is Kirkenes to, to tie together with what Abby and Timo has been saying. You know, Kirkenes experienced the, the economic crisis back in 2008. Um, then there was a boom after this, luckily. They're mainly focusing on tourism, uh, partnering with Finland. So that was cross-border cooperation. They got not tourists from Norway, but tourists from Finland coming into Kirkenes. They also uh, were opening up to Russia. So uh, suddenly there was a cross-border collaboration between Northern Norway and Russia. Um, and then, I mean, and Kirkenes is closer to the border of Russia and closer to the border of Finland than to any parts of, in Norway. Um, so it's all the way in the top of Norway. And then COVID came. So COVID closed down borders. It had a massive impact on the small border communities in the Arctic. Uh, and then of course the war came uh, in Ukraine. And, and when I go to Kirkenes and I speak to people there, and it was similar to what Abby and Timo said, the problems already started in 2014. And I also think that's an important context. When we talk about all of this, it's not only in the past six months, but it's something that has affected border regions and Arctic collaboration since Crimea. Um, so Kirkenes is really a place where they have done active corporations from before borders were drawn in the region with the Sami uh, people traveling across borders, uh, and now it's definitely challenged. So that's the that's the negative story fitting into what the previous speakers have said. That obviously active collaboration is challenged because of borders, because of geopolitics. But we also have stories like Greenland and Canada that, that I've used to work a lot with, and they see huge potential for collaboration. There's a lot of investments going between Canada and Greenland. Uh, you also see the US opening up a consulate in Greenland. You see the European Commission opening up a consulate in Greenland. And suddenly there is a lot more interest in other parts of the Arctic for many reasons. And why is that? That's because the Arctic region has a lot of the things, and, and Abby talked about this, has a lot of things that the rest of the world needs. So if you put it very simple, we got fish to feed the world. So that's the, that's the food industry mainly. We got energy to power industries, traditionally oil and gas from the Russian Arctic, but it's also renewable energy, uh, especially the hydrogen. And then we got raw materials needed in the green tr tr transition. I also want to just give honorable mentions to other industries like tourism, uh, the forestry industries in northern part of Sweden and especially Finland. You've got a lot of entrepreneurship. Uh, Abby mentioned satellites and how the dual use of like defense and first responders. So there's a lot of investments in defense that also benefits the local communities. And then, you know, there's a lot of other industries. But but I just want to focus quickly on on the key ones, which is seafood, is energy and is, is raw materials. And, and I think we see a positive change now. We see companies like battery production opening up in northern Sweden, northern Norway, because it has cheap energy, because there's plenty of space and because it's close access to the mining. That's not because of a war or anything, but that's because the Arctic is actually suitable for the green transition. So what we lack now um, to say is not only about geopolitics and Russia and one conflict, what we actually lack in the Arctic region is three things. One is we need infrastructure. So we need like better electricity grids. If we want to be energy dependent from, from other places in the world, we need to develop our electricity grids. We also need to develop ports and airports and housing and so on, because demographic is, is another issue. Then we need investments. We need more large scale investments in the Arctic. Um, if you invest in the Arctic, it's very much long term return of investment. It's not like uh, doing an investment in Berlin or Paris. You need long term ho horizons. Uh, and also there's not the same economy of scale in the Arctic, so you need more public-private partnerships, which I see as a positive when it comes to, to corporations. Um, also, just a quick comment relating to investments, what Abby mentioned with our Chinese investments. I, I like that every story I have read the past 10 years always shows that there's less uh, Chinese investments in the Arctic than what every, all the policymakers like to think of. Um, so, so all researchers knows this, all business people knows this, but policymakers always talks about this uh, scaremongering of, of Chinese investments. Um, at the same time, they roll out the carpet in Oslo and Helsinki and Copenhagen. If there's Chinese investments coming, they are trying to, to stop them in the Arctic. Um, we would actually be interested in responsibly investments. You know, as long as it's done in a proper, transparent, responsible ways, I think we should be open for investments from everywhere. Um, so the chief three challenges and the last of the three challenges is people, demographics. So the, the main growth sector in the Arctic region is old people. 
So if you look at the demographics, you see old people is growing in a rapid speed. The young people are leaving the region and we need a lot more people in the region. We are, it's really a main issue because there is a lot of opportunity for, for business, um, but the challenges is people investments and, and infrastructure. So to, to round up, the world definitely needs the Arctic. I would, I would believe so because we got fish, because we got energy, because we got raw materials. The future of economic collaboration is good, but it's challenged. Uh, it's challenging times for companies, not only in the Arctic, but anywhere in the world. You know, anyone who is a global player is challenged by the sanctions regimes right now, by recessions and inflations. Uh, and yeah, that will be my roundup. So there's potentials, but it's not, it's not only easy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mads. And indeed, uh, you were the most optimistic of the bunch. Um, so it's good to also have, uh, you know, this other side of the story and this other point of view, which is that uh, the economic cooperation is still proceeding and that uh, whereas the world could or Arctic nations could suspend the Arctic Council, the economic cooperation, some of it was unsuspendable. <laughs> it was underway and it, it is simply continuing to proceed. So all of these are fascinating points. Uh, I'd like to go uh, further now with a bit of Q&A. Uh, Timo, I'd like to uh, come back to you. Now, given the suspension of the Arctic Council, do you think that the Arctic can be governed without cooperation with Russia? Um, as you know, as people know, Russia is not just a number in the Arctic. There are eight Arctic Council members and there are five Arctic Council littoral or coastal states. Russia is not just a number in the Arctic. Russia is half the Arctic physically and a very vast proportion of the Arctic in terms of ownership of its natural resources. It is the bulk of, uh, of the Arctic's natural gas, for example. Uh, it is also the, nor uh, the, the northeastern sea route uh, is also uh, along the Russian coastline. And that's one of the sea routes that, of course, the world is eyeing for um, uh, for future, uh, as a future route, major route for international trade. So um, can there really be a future for economic, uh, for, sorry, for, uh, um, uh, for collaboration in the Arctic without the involvement of Russia? Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question. It's, it's uh, certainly a valid one. Um, I would say that, um, as we know, that, that that Russia is such a huge, huge part of the Arctic, and and, and most of the people people are, are living there. Their uh, indigenous peoples, industrial activities, and also, like also from the from the many of the kind of investments that that have gone into the northwest of Russia, they have really been, for instance, for Finland and and, and for the Nordics, have been very important because we have we can we can make very important kind of environmental investments exactly to the the Russian northwest regions and that's that's really also from our, from the viewpoint of our climate policy it has been it has been uh, uh, of much importance so whether we can do it or not um i think that it's in my in my world it's, it's more about like that there are various types of cooperation processes already ongoing with russia so Bilateral cooperation is going on. There is uh, regional cooperation is going on with Russia, not with full force, but it's still going. Um, and Russia, Russia is still part of the global governance uh, framework. So of course, it is not delivering on fully on 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 what it is committed to. So there is some kind of governance all the time ongoing. And as I as I was also trying to say that Arctic Council is in is not in any kind of suspension. So there's 70 pro projects are now in uh, now ongoing. I'm, I'm for instance, in one of those. And those, those are kind of specifically uh, those 70 projects because Russians are not party to those projects. So there is this very strong diplomatic effort now to keep somehow the Arctic Council moving forward. We don't know whether that's going to be successful, but but um, at least there is a major concerted effort. In our report, um, we also kind of speculated about these, these 
these possible scenarios. And I think that it's, it's fair to say that, that if, because Arctic Council is, is so important for, 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 the, for the governance of the region for many, many reasons. Um, if there is a, a, a scenario that, that, that we, we cannot you know, work together with Russia, then there has to be a, 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 an Arctic cooperation between, between the eight, eight Arctic states. So we would be kind of in that scenario. And of course, like I'm, I'm always trying to emphasize the uncertainty certainty that we are facing not even know what's the outcome of, of the Ukraine Ukraine war, et cetera, and what are the kind of repercussions of, of that. So I think that it's in that kind of um, world where, where, where we couldn't really uh, work with Russia, um, for instance, through the Arctic Council, it may seem likely for many that, that there will be a, a two types of Arctic cooperation processes, and the one is is moving towards the, the kind of unified West, which is, of course, the, the Western states have really found their unity now, now with this uh, Ukraine war, and then Russia perhaps going to to the eastern eastern direction. So these types of um, let's say speculative things that I can say. Um, thank you, Timo. Um, so, uh, very interesting. So, you basically think um, that some form of cooperation with Russia will continue to proceed and is indeed already underway, bilateral, some bilateral cooperation, regional cooperation. So, there, there may be ways to collaborate with Russia uh, and to involve it in Arctic affairs that don't go through what is the now suspended Arctic Council. Um, so, uh, so that, that's very useful, uh, to know and to hear, uh, my follow up question to you is now for the Arctic council itself. Do you think it will be resurrected in 2023? Russia was supposed to pass on the chairmanship, I believe, to Norway in 2023. What is your prognosis for what we may see early next year? Is it coming back or is it never coming back? Yeah, that was what I was struggling struggling with in my in my presentation as well. That, that it's it's extremely difficult to say, and I think that Arctic experts are totally divided over this. It's almost like fifty fifty split uh, as, at the moment in terms of the analysts. I'm one of those that are perhaps a little bit more optimistic. That I'm still thinking that the, there are the bases for continuing the Arctic Council cooperation because it is founded on on the consensus and if we are finding a, a, a situation where the, the western states and for instance we have to emphasize that if you look at the for instance the the the, the, the most recent uh, arctic strategy of, of the united states even if there are very heavy emphasis also on security they are also emphasizing these kind of cooperative possibilities in the arctic region and we have to also keep uh, keep in mind that that for for the U.S., um, even if it now seems like that everything is about Russia, for U.S. the more more important actor is of course China, and U.S. doesn't want to have a, a large presence of China in the Arctic. So I think that 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 type of thinking kind of cultivates a view that 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 U.S. would be by the end of the day favorable to to try to work with Russia. You know, with this kind of transitional period, um, and, and to somehow move it forward, um, it would of course require from Russia type of a silent presence. I would say in the Arctic Council for for some time in the future, at, le at the very least, for the time being that that we are seeing the Ukraine war. So of course, these are big question marks as to whether this can go forward. I know that from the insiders in the Arctic Council and, and from the diplomats that that certainly there is a concerted effort to try that. Um, but I don't think that they can, I mean, that's that's their business. That's what they are trying to do. And, and I don't know if, if that will be successful. Thank you very much, Timo. Uh, Abby, I'd like to come to you. So, um, 
in your comments, you made clear that we are not yet at conflict stage in the Arctic. There is militarization, uh, there is a revisiting of priorities in the Arctic, but we're not yet at conflict stage. I, I want to ask you, though, about um, things that we've been hearing and reading about regarding underwater cables. Um, the risk of them being severed up in the Arctic. Um, there was concern in Norway recently that some cables between Svalbard and, and the mainland had been severed. Um, there's also, of course, you know, people are looking at what happened in the Baltic to uh, the Nord Stream pipeline uh, and want to know whether, you know, we are at risk of seeing um, more of these things or similar things um, in the Arctic. What would you say to that? So that's a very good question. And uh, it seems that my, my connection is a little unstable, so you'll let me know if I need to sign out and come back in. But um, it's assuming everything's working okay, uh, I, I won't comment directly on the possibilities for you know severing cables and, and things like that. Uh, but what I will say is that certainly in the scenarios that I discussed where we you know previously had thought about what would a increase of uh, geostrategic tensions look like uh, that that certainly um, these not unimportant but short of a full um, obvious conflict types of activities are, are certainly part of that scenario and so you know whether we may expect to see more of that in in the future I don't know but it is certainly something that um, is an aspect of of those scenarios yes And uh, what would you say, Abby, to uh, the concern that um, the fastest way for a Russian attack or the shortest distance for a Russian attack on the US is via the Arctic? Uh, how, how is that impacting the militarization of the region, that consideration, uh, as well as the new types of missiles that, um, that countries are developing? Well, I would say the discussions and, and um, advertised plans are consistent with good awareness that, you know, the, the geography is such that um, uh, that um, certainly coverage by satellites and radar systems and having um, other other capabilities to counter those sorts of um, scenarios um, are very important. But again, I guess I'll go back to history and say that was also true, you know, during the Cold War. And yes, of course, our the weapon systems have changed, and so we can't be unaware of that. Um, but again, I, I fear a little bit the um, uh, the tendency to think only in the moment and amplify messages to say, oh, you know, Russia is about to attack the, you know, attack Alaska or something like that, which. Um, you know, Frank, maybe someone else has seen evidence for that, but but I can say that at least for myself that I, I haven't seen haven't seen that kind of evidence. So there is a, a bit of a concern about the amplification of these sorts of messages that, you know, ultimately um, might lead to misunderstandings or miscommunications uh, in ways that, um, you know, could further escalate tensions in, in a way that it, that is concerning. So it's a I, I think it's a. Um, Important to have a sort of 2, 2 perspectives here on the, on the 1 hand, certainly to be aware of the geography and the history and the. The um, increasing capabilities um, of militaries on the other hand, to just be um, to be aware of. Um, you know, what the, what the realities actually look like and what the. What the most plausible scenarios of concern are, if you will, I. Um, I think. Again, there is a. Um, with increasing military activity in the region. It is a growing concern of having an accident or some other miscommunication or something that was totally, you know, unintended. Then, it, then snowballing into, um, you know, an in, in escalation of tensions. Um, and to me, that is also an important scenario. In addition to, you know, thinking through what the uh, overall increase of military capabilities are and what an actual attack might look like. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mads, uh, before putting my own questions to you, there are two questions uh, from viewers that have just been sent to me to you. So the first one is, um, as you look at economic collaboration in the Arctic and the economic development of the Arctic, 
uh, how is the Arctic Economic Council helping Arctic indigenous people? So uh, there are about 1.5 million of them. Um, are some of the projects that you're looking at likely to benefit them? That's the first question that I've received. And the second is on sustainable economic development in the Arctic. So the Arctic is melting, as we know, uh, because of climate change. And yet uh, uh, a lot of the interest in the Arctic today is fueled by its fossil fuel resources. So um, what, is, uh, what is your vision for, for sustainable economic development in the Arctic? Thank you. Two very good questions. I'm glad we have until three o'clock. Um, I, uh, I, I, I just want to, before I answer those questions, I, I just want to, to just comment briefly on, on what the previous two speakers have said. I, I think, and I think the, the two speakers answered perfectly, but but I also, we have to be careful that we don't talk up escalations in the region, you know, because then uh, if, if we have a prophecy about this, then it, it might might come true. You know, we, we need to, the, the Russians like to call the Arctic the territory of dialogue. And that really, that really is because of, as, I'm going to answer now about indigenous people, you know, so if you look at indigenous groups in North Norway, Northern Finland, Northern Russia, they travel across borders. Um, and also when it comes to climate research, we need cross border collaboration. When it comes to search and rescue, we need cross border collaboration, for example, between the US and Russia, as we see, but also between Norway and 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 Russia. So I think we should just be careful not not talking up escalation only. Um, there is really a, a, a good place for, for dialogue in the Arctic. Regarding indigenous people, so the indigenous groups in the Arctic is around 10% of the total population of the region, uh, according to the Arctic Council. Uh, but they take out more than 25% of the memberships in the Arctic Economic Council. Um, likewise, in our executive committee, we have five members and one of them is always allocated, dedicated to indigenous groups. So they have 20% of the voting rights in the board and they will consist of, of a fourth uh, of our members. So the indigenous groups has a huge interest in, in, in getting, you know, economic independence. So, so that's also creating sustainable economic development is in the interest of many uh, indigenous groups. Personally, I always like to say, you know, look, look at the Aleuts, for example, in, in Alaska, look at the ICC in, in Greenland. Uh, ICC in Greenland has for many years been talking about mining, uh, that they really encourage mining uh, in, in, in Greenland. Uh, the Aleuts has been working in energy uh, for many years, so has the Athabascans and the Gwich'in. So, so there is really a, a big involvement of indigenous groups in the Arctic. Thank God for that. But I want to I want to give you a good example of of how I see the future when it comes to this and innovative, because there's a small U.S. startup called Paul Arctic, and and what they did is they recently did a program with Nunavut Fisheries Associations and WWF. So basically, what they did is that uh, Paul Arctic took climate data for the past 50 years, they combined it with the fishing data for the past 30 or so years fishing quotas. And then they went out to interview the indigenous people and asked them, where did you use to catch fish before we had data? So they put all of this data together and now they can not only predict how the, the fishery is going to change with global warming, but they can also help guide the local communities and says, most likely with our data set and with artificial intelligence or machine learning, we can tell you where the fish will be tomorrow. So in this way, we got big scientific data. We got uh, state-of-the-art research from the universities and it benefits both decision makers making long-term decisions but it also benefits the indigenous communities and that's really what we have to do in the arctic more and more we need to make sure it benefits the local communities and that's not only for the indigenous groups that goes for everyone living in the arctic region so so that was the the indigenous uh, question and also especially within the food sector i could speak a lot more about indigenous food i think there's a massive potential for exporting seal meat for example uh, we just need to taste the change the palate of, of europeans and north americans and but anyway and regarding sustainable development um, we are not going to get rid of of oil and gas tomorrow and that, that's everyone knows this to be realistic uh, we have to change we have to go through an energy transition and we already see that in the arctic when it comes to energy i mean the 
those of us living in the Arctic, we feel we heard it from both of the speakers. Climate change or global warming happens at three times the global average in the Arctic, seven times the global average in Svalbard. We have absolutely no interest in, in, in increasing this uh, climate change, but it's not because of people living in the Arctic that climate change is happening. It's because of people living in in big cities around the world. So it, it's, it's actually more, more likely to ask what is people in Geneva doing uh, for climate change than what people in the Arctic are doing in, for climate change. Because if you look at in Iceland, uh, for example, it's primarily geothermal energy. If you look in Norway, it's primarily hydro energy in the Norwegian Arctic. I got negative energy prices where I live in the Norwegian Arctic uh, because electricity is so cheap and it's completely green. Uh, if you look to, to Finland and Sweden, it's wind turbines. If you look to, to small remote communities in Canada, it's, it's solar panels. So there's a lot of things happening around renewable energy. And also you will see it around hydrogen production, which is really going to be the future. And, and then also I, and, and another comment on the sustainable or responsible economic development. I, I think everyone wants to drive in electric vehicles. Everyone wants to have wind turbines put up and green energy. But for that, we need raw materials. And right now, we, we are sourcing most of our raw materials from Democratic Republic of Congo, from Mozambique, uh, from, from China. And we have to ask ourselves, do we think that mining in Finland or, or northern Sweden and northern Norway is more responsible than mining in, in Congo? And I, I think it is when it comes to framework conditions. And we need those raw materials for the green transitions. You know, we cannot, we cannot get a green transition without raw materials. So, so that's why I'm, I'm mentioning that. And then finally, as I mentioned, seafood. Today, protein intake from, from, from protein, global protein intake from seafood is only 7%. So if we have to eat less meat, we need to eat more fish and more plants like seaweed. And, and the Arctic can definitely do a lot there. But good questions. Thank you. Good questions and uh, excellent answers. And thank you very much, uh, Mads, for what you've just mentioned here, giving us some very, some very useful context uh, when we discuss this issue. Um, there is a perception indeed that uh, people are going to the Arctic for precisely the kinds of resources that have destroyed the Arctic. But I think you've given that view a bit of balance in your response. Um, there is a question from a viewer that I think is uh, I could address to all three of you, which is how are indigenous people reacting uh, and how are they looking at the current geopolitical situation uh, and its impact on their lives up in the Arctic? Uh, and let me just mention to, uh, you know, to uh, viewers who are on this call that indigenous people cut across uh, indigenous uh, uh, communities and groups like the Sanis, the Inuits cut across many different countries in the Arctic. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the Samis are both in Russia and in Norway and other countries and, and so on. Uh, same for the Inuits, same for a lot of the other uh, indigenous groups. Um, and so uh, how are they perceiving this conflict? Uh, is it tearing them apart? Um, Timo, I'll start with you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good, good question. I think that it's uh, it's been certainly diff difficult for them in the context of the Arctic Council. So there, they have a very unique kind of status as as its permanent participants, and are sitting in the in the same tables as as for instance in the foreign ministers' meetings, um, in the same same uh, same room and 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 the, and the same same table and, and 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 as almost like equal participants. So so certainly it's a uh, it's a very unique position for them to to kind of inform um, and 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 influence uh, how how the, the kind of Arctic Council uh, decision making shapes up. The problem now, of course, is that that um, some of the so that there are three of the permanent participants having also a kind of uh, let's say a Russian chapter. Then we have the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples in the Arctic, which has Kind of explicitly endorsed the the war in, in Ukraine in Putin's terms, so obviously it, it makes it makes things a, a little bit difficult. I would say that that the the message from especially from the Inter Inuit Circumpolar Council, which is possibly the most influential of the six permanent participants, and also from the to some extent from the Sami Council, transnational peoples 
living in, in many states has been that, that again, it happens to us that the state actions are dividing us. So that has been the kind of consistent message that because of state action, we are being divided again. So certainly they have been, they have expressed disappointment at all also for, for what has happened in the Arctic Council, that it hasn't been able to continue. I mean, uh, seriously, like literally, they, they have they have been very critical of of um of some of the governments that that why is this happening? And and I think that that those of us who are looking and, and discussing with our security colleagues, for instance, I think that it's very difficult to think that that we could have just continued the Arctic Council cooperation, to be honest. But but their viewpoint is, is certainly that the Arctic Council should continue. And I think that that um, what they would be thinking in the context of the Arctic Council um, is really that, that they would really want to have it more clearly codified in the rules of procedure as well that that their factual role in the Arctic Council has, has been basically, um, um, they have been able to block any decision-making process if they have just just jointly uh, worked um, um, in the in the in the in the process of decision making. So they have had a very unique uh, decision-making power in any kind of intergovernmental organization. You will not find such an such a uh, unique um, uh, role, but that's, I would say that's the kind of their perspective. Okay, state action is again dividing us, and we are not happy about that. Thank you, uh, Abby. How would you comment on this uh, from a security point of view? How are indigenous people viewing the current conflict? Sure. Let me start by saying that I think that both um. Mats and, and Timo have made some really important points uh, here already. Um, from the discussions that I have um, been privileged to have with some of our in Indigenous colleagues, I would say a, a very important question that is often raised is security for whom? Uh, when it comes to development, development for from who, you know, who, for whom? Uh, we talk about a, uh, you know, energy transition, a just energy transition for whom? And so I think um, these sorts of questions are are very important. I don't think that we've gotten to the bottom of the answers or what the what the um, kind of the right answer is. There may not be a single right answer, uh, but these are the sorts of important questions that I think, um, at least in in my conversations, that Indigenous colleagues have have raised, and uh, I think we need to continue paying attention to um, when we we look at. Just generally speaking, uh, not just in the Arctic, but perhaps I can take a more general view of of, of military presence. Um, it is true that the argument has been made that you know a military can uh, provide a nucleus around which a con community can form and develop and thrive, and certainly provides potentially resources and first responder capabilities and things like that. But I think it's also very important to remember that communities have existed in the Arctic for, you know, not not just decades, but, um, but centuries and thousands of years. And so there are already communities and, and um, how is uh, a security perspective um, influencing that perspective on communities? Um, uh, and in some cases, uh, I think, understandably, it's, it's seen as a very potentially very negative thing. So I think continuing to, um, to be inclusive of in indigenous voices, which um, it's difficult to think about why why indigenous voices would not would not have been included from the very beginning of Arctic policy discussions, um, uh, you know, be just because of the uh, the history and community presence in the region um, will continue to be important. And I think we've seen some progress on that front, but um, not not wishing to speak for any any indigenous representatives here, I, I would say that my my impression is that there's certainly there's certainly a long a long road to go, and I think it starts with those definitions that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that perhaps a bit more from a scientific um, and research perspective, um, another issue that's very important is um, is 
determining how to uh, incorporate uh, traditional or indigenous knowledge into um, into research. And uh, Mats mentioned this actually, and used the example of Polarctic, which is a really good example. Um, and I think this is something that uh, we're still contending with um, as, you know, um, we make policy, including security decisions about the Arctic region, finding ways of incorporating um, obviously indigenous perspectives and, and knowledge, traditional knowledge into, into the research that feeds that is, is, is vitally important, but it's also vitally important to not, um, uh, to not take indigenous knowledge and then just treat it as if it's, you know, usable and publicly available. You know, this is, the, these these elements of knowledge are are very important to indigenous communities and there's a lot of respect that needs to go uh, along with that and how that information is treated and protected as an example and i that's another issue that i just don't think that we've um we really worked through yet uh and we need to so i'll end with that thank you thank you very much for that abby uh, Mads, in indigenous people, um, how they're looking at the current conflict from an economic perspective. Wh what are you seeing in the Arctic Economic Council? I mean, I will, uh, I will really echo <laughs> Timo and Abby and says, I really think we should ask the indigenous groups about this uh, rather than, than Abby, Timo and me. Um, but but because we don't have the, the access to that, I, I would just say that I mean, this conflict is really hurting the indigenous groups. We, I mean, Timo mentioned himself that we have six permanent participants in the Arctic Council. Three of them have Russian chapters, you know, and, and, and they don't have the same resources as national nation states. And, and that also comes to communication, that comes to diplomatic immunity, it comes to a lot. Of, so it, it really, I mean, they're, they're challenged a lot more than, than a lot, a lot of other people. Um, I think though that. The, the good thing, if you look at ICC, uh, for example, they have really been championing this concept of nothing about us without us uh, more and more. And, and I think it has maybe been accelerated uh, due to the situation we stand in now that more people are actually listening to them. And it should really be nothing about us without us. That means, for example, when, when there's defense uh, budget is made in Denmark, suddenly they are involved a lot more. We see a change in regulation in Finland uh, these days regarding the indigenous groups. So as I, I, I definitely see there's a change from, from policymakers in how they work with indigenous groups. And when it comes to, when it, when it comes to, to business, it really is about access to market for a lot of indigenous groups. And that's that's difficult for a lot of uh, small business owners, but it's also difficult for, for indigenous groups. And that especially comes when it comes to like reindeer, for example. So reindeer, when you want to export that to global markets, you often need some kind of certification or EU certification and so on, which is difficult to get if you do it in a traditional manner, the slaughtering of the deer. Of the deer. The same goes for, as I mentioned, seals or whale and so on. There can be some what is traditional seen as traditional business in indigenous uh, communities is suddenly not seen as traditional uh, communities uh, or businesses other places. So, so, but that's a challenge from the, before the war. So let me just say there's a lot of challenges getting indigenous products to the market um, because of culture, because of scale, because of a lot of other issues. Um, but but I think Abby and Timo answered the questions perfectly, so no more to add. There's a follow-up question from a viewer on this topic of Indigenous people that is specific to RIPON. Um, so RIPON for uh, viewers on this call is the um, uh, is is the uh, association that groups Russian Indigenous. Uh, um, uh, Russian indigenous uh, um, people, if you will, from many different ethnicities, uh, over 40 of them, I believe. Um, and it's one of the biggest uh, indigenous people's associations or the biggest indigenous people's associations up in the Arctic. And the question is, um, uh, is the current, will the current conflict um, impact the ties between other indigenous associations and RIPON. 
will RIPON have credibility? Will, will other organizations, other indigenous uh, communities still want to cooperate with RIPON? And the second uh, subset to that uh, question is whether RIPON is really free to express itself. Are indigenous people in Russia really able to express themselves as they wish? Timo, let me start with you to see if you want to take a stab at that and then I'll see if, uh, if the others want to comment. Yeah, thanks. Uh, difficult, difficult question. So, so I think that it, it was at about 2012 when, when apparently the, the leadership of Ripon was was removed, and and new pe people were installed by by the Russian Federation into that organization's leadership. So I think that that's that's. As far as I understand the situation, that, that that's what has happened, and of course that's why they have also um, endorsed the the, the this, this um, illegal aggression against Ukraine, and then there is this kind of shadow government of the let's say previous ripon leaders who have who have condemned the, the Russian aggression, etc. So I think that that's it's <laughs> it's extremely difficult to. To then kind of think further from here, so I think that it's. Uh, I think that perhaps perhaps uh, Abby and Mads can 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 say something, but I mean I, I think that the situation is pretty much at the stalemate at the moment. So. Yeah. Thank you, Timo. Uh, Mads, do you want to take a stab at this? Ripe on. I mean, I I can just follow. Uh... I can just follow Timo. I, I think with a lot of things that goes on in Russia at the moment, I would like to quote uh, Winston Churchill when he says that Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So, so right time right now is 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 a little bit difficult to to actually know what goes on, and the same goes for Ray Pond. Abby, any views on Ray Pond? I think it's just another example of of how this uh, this this war is really is really impacting um, indigenous organizations among among all sorts of other stakeholders in the in the Arctic region, uh, and just I'll just second the comments that we've made previously that um, it would be great to hear some in, indigenous perspectives on, on this issue. But um, I appreciate the points that uh, Timo and Mods have made. I think they're 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 on point. So I have nothing further. Thank you. And now I'd like to take you all in a different direction. There are a lot of questions, as you can imagine, on China. Uh, and uh, the first question I have is this. Uh, the, in this question, uh, one of the viewers is saying that in 2019, as you know, Mike Pompeo delivered a kind of explosive statement uh, at an Arctic Council meeting uh, in Finland. Where he basically, um, where he basically cautioned Arctic states against cooperation with China and delivered a stark warning to China, saying that there is no such thing as a near Arctic state, uh, and that Chinese investments in the Arctic uh, were creating damage. Um, now, the, the viewer is asking, uh, uh, what are the implications of this? Uh, what is what is cooperation with China in the Arctic likely to look like in future? Um, so I'll start with uh, I'll start with Timo once again, and then move um, to the rest of you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, we we did a. A study again to the Finnish government back in 2019 before the pandemic and before the, the this uh, Ukraine war uh, exactly about the Chinese policy and presence in the Arctic and um, I was there also in, in when when the foreign ministers meeting in, in as part of the Finnish delegation watching all those weird things that happened during the Rodimi foreign ministers meeting where, they, where, for instance, the U.S. delegation could not accept a declaration which stated climate change, and that was then deleted, and that was the first time when the the Arctic Council ministerial could not agree on a on a ministerial declaration. Going to China, I think that our report we did it with uh, both China experts and, and those of us who are more focused on the Arctic region. We didn't. 
we didn't think China. China is still a fairly relative newcomer in the region. I would still say that that I would still say that that's that's correct. So their their main presence is is scientific, um, and their economic presence is is um, to some extent. I think that it's most kind of focused on on the Russian Russian side of the Arctic, especially the the natural gas um, kind of um, investments. Um, in, Yal in, in Yamal Peninsula, etc. Um, to some extent, there are some some in, in kind of smaller investments in in other parts of the Arctic. But overall, our view of the, the kind of economic presence of the, of China was was that it was not that kind of significant. Let's put it this way. So, if you read any any newspapers on the topic, you would you would say the exact opposite. But that the it's also because the Arctic states and and you know the Western states in general have been kind of for for quite some time they have already um, been very very off of these major investments from China, like especially the kind of strategic investments to to infrastructure. So these have been kind of one after the other. These have been kind of halted by by different types of processes. I guess that one thing that I, I I many times kind of mentioning here is that I think that we have to be also be kind of aware that that we are part of this kind of US China world world where there is a bipartisan support for very strong China policy in the US. And the way US is is speaking of China and Chinese Various types of activities, also including economic activities, is that they are viewing everything very dubiously, and they are trying to also exert their leadership because they do have a leadership um, in NATO via NATO. They do try to also use that um, power of influence, so they also portray Chinese activities in a certain way. I think that we have to be. Very open about that. Finland is very, very eagerly now. My my home country is moving, moving to to NATO, and I think that there's no doubt about that. We have to accept the U.S. reality with that as well. So, I think that our overall the overall view was that China China's current presence um, so is is more about science, some economic presence. Then there are Kind of accusations of dual activities in some scientific uh, installations, which we don't know what 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 are there. Then about the long term presence, then I think that then it becomes much more viable kind of view to see China's footprint in the region to grow, because we are kind of witnessing gradual. Still, I I would guess that most analysts would say that China is growing. And will continue to grow as a as a kind of major power, and 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 then its footprint in different parts of the re of the world will kind of gradually be on the increase. So, but currently, I would say that it, it's a little bit exaggerated in my view. Thank you for that, Timo Mads. Um, China and uh, and. Uh economic collaboration in light of the Mike Pompeo speech, and also if you could comment perhaps on the FTAs of China in the area. Yeah, so so I think, I mean, it, I think China is a good example of this. I mean, what, what some policymakers and researchers are called Arctic exceptionalism from before the war. I mean, it never really happened. I mean, the Arctic has always been a part of, uh, of the global stage, uh, which means that the China policy in Washington also affects the China policy in Alaska, obviously. Um, and as Simon mentioned, that also influences uh, NATO. Uh, and I think a good example of this is, is when Huawei were trying to sell their 5G to the Faroe Islands, uh, someone stepped in and it was not possible for Huawei to sell 5G to, to the Faroe Islands. That's not because of the Arctic, that's just a EU, you know, 
reluctancy. So, so that's that 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 is not the Arctic exceptionalism or non-exceptionalism. It's just the Arctic is a is a player on the main stage. I think from if we look since the war, I think it's interesting to notice that that China has gotten discounted rates from energy from 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 Russia um, because Russia has has to to sell their energy products to somewhere else than than. Um, than Europe, so so suddenly China got a lot of like thirty percent discounts on on their energy from Russia. But what is also interesting is that China is like being more and more reluctant because most of the insurance companies uh, that that covers these ships uh, shipping energy are from the U.S. and the U.K. So when China has to to stand and control, you know, am I going to follow? The rest of the world, I'm not going to follow Russia. They're going to go with the rest of the world uh, in the Arctic because China still has to export to a lot more places. So when we look at this conflict and, and business, you know, yes, there were some potential in the beginning, but then uh, it's changing now. I mean, as the as the war uh, prolongs and and China has become a very realistic player on, on the global scene. And finally, I also just want to say, if you look at a country like like Greenland, uh, 95, 98 percent of their export is fish, and one third of their export goes to China. So, so China is a really big market for, and the same goes for the Faroe Islands. The same goes for Canada and, and Alaska and so on. China is an important market when it comes to seafood export. So, it's not only about China coming and 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 and, and trading or investing in the region. It's also about them buying a lot of our products. Um, and when it comes to free trade agreement, there will never be like an Arctic China free trade agreement. That's that's not realistic. But there will be free trade agreements with the U.S. So maybe it will be maybe it could be free trade agreements with other nations. But it's not going to be it's not going to be an Arctic China free trade agreement. Uh, too many sovereign states with very specific frameworks. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Abby. Uh, China from a security point of view in the Arctic in light of the Mike Pompeo speech, is it a strategic threat in some way? So I'll offer my personal professional opinion um, just by starting uh, to say that um, if a goal that that China has is to be part of the Arctic discussion and have a seat at the table, I think that we are seeing a perfect example that it, very successful strategy because we are all talking in, uh, about China right now in this discussion um, and many others um, to, to say the least. So I think um, I, I think if that was a goal, it has been it has been uh, well achieved, at least in terms of the discourse. Um, I think earlier we talked a little bit about the um, perhaps a disconnect between uh, the, the policy community and, and maybe of what parts aspects of that may be amplified in the in the media and kind of the rea economic and scientific and other realities on the ground. And I, I think that's true here uh, to some extent where there's a lot of discussion about um, the uh, certainly the US news media and elsewhere about the security threat that uh, China you know may speculatively pose in the Arctic. Um, among other other places um, from that perspective. Um, but when you look at the behavior and activities on the ground, you kind of wonder where where is that? Why is that disconnect there? And where what is what is the reality, if you will? Um, I think it's a really important point that China is um, has not simply expressed um, you know, forays into to making investments in the Arctic, though. Uh, considerably less than I think one would think based on on where some of the media coverage and where some of the policy discussion is going, but also that uh, China is such an important trading partner, um, as we've already talked about. So, you know, from a security perspective, at least in terms of previous actions, you know, I will say that we we haven't seen a uh, we have seen you know Chinese presence of various varieties, a lot of the scientific um, and uh, otherwise. Um, I think there was a significant incident, you know, just a few months ago with um, Russia and Chinese, you know, military vessels operating together in the Bering Bering Sea um, that the U.S. Coast Guard encountered. You know, that certainly I, I can understand why that would raise eyebrows, right? But at the same time, if we if we look at the broad picture, um, there is there is quite a bit of concern expressed in some communities that doesn't exactly match if we just put out the economic and other activity that um, China is interested in participating in or is participating in, um, you know, there is a there is a bit of a disconnect. And so um, 
you know, yet yet another area that I, I sometimes wonder, um, you know, whether there could be a chance for some positive diplomacy through through the Arctic, um, but uh, how that may play out in the future, especially given um, the uh, somewhat elevated cooperation between um, Russia and China at the moment uh, that remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, for that. Um, now, before we close, what I'd like to do is to offer each one of you a chance to comment on the topic of this session, the Arctic, a zone of peace or a zone of conflict. What is your, uh, what is your forecast for the Arctic and what would it take to ensure that it is and, and that it remains a zone of peace? Timo, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, difficult to kind of just 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 um, put it in, in in those those two categories um, because I mean we just conducted this this um, uh, you know very quick study to 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 our government about what is happening with the with the Arctic cooperation and 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 you know one cannot avoid. One cannot avoid the the kind of um, feeling that that certainly something significant has happened, and and um, and um, much of the you know long term kind of cooperative kind of achievements are really at you know they are really in in, in difficult negotiations currently. So even if if our study also reveals that there is there is a lot of kind of ongoing cooperation with Russia, I think that it's it's it certainly is a for a person like me who has, who has been researching Arctic for 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 over over 10, 20 years. So so obviously it is a it is a it's a very sad sad picture. So most most of the non non governmental cooperation there's lots has been has come to almost full full stop um yeah like like with russia there's not much economic ties anymore um we are trying to somehow survive with the arctic council which i i just just <laughs> it's very difficult to even even for me to imagine what the world looks like the arctic world without the arctic council um but I, I I have to accept this as as, as a reality at the, at the moment. So that that Russian aggression has done some you know veritable damage, and I think that the the the, the scarier part is that that this comes down to also our discussion here that that when we are in the Arctic Council or other Arctic oriented or originated forums, we are knowing about the realities of kind of challenges of sustainable development, environmental protection, economic challenges in the region, indigenous peoples. But then when we when we start to discuss about these issues with military leaders, with security analysts, they don't know about the this is they don't care about these issues. For them there's a big, you know, maps and they are looking at these maps and 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 you know you know you know looking at what are the military capabilities and what are the strategic scenarios here and there. So this is the, the my, my kind of, um, my kind of um, worst case scenario really is that, that this, that the Arctic becomes also overtaken by these kind of security kind of, um, kind of scenarios and, and, and kind of calculations. And I think that that's a kind of, that's a reality that, that we cannot just say that it it cannot you know come to dominate in the region at the moment. We have a very changed uh, hard security uh, situation. We have many of the, the 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 European states have fundamentally changed their hard security kind of relationship with Russia. So of course we are living with you know under so much uncertainty, but I think that we have to take this as a kind of I mean, um, as, a, as a kind of a real threat for, for the Arctic region and its future. 
and um, I think that it's it's uh, it's something that I'm 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 appreciating a lot that there are a lot of these diplomats and and insiders to the Arctic Council, insiders to these various types of organizations, are really trying to convince the other layers of these nation states that we have to somehow be able to keep on working with Russia. And I'm, I'm, I, I try to remain hopeful that this will be the case. But I, I do think that we have to take these hard security issues and the possibility that they will come to dominate our thinking of the Arctic region. I, I think we have to take them seriously as well. This, this is my kind of final, a little bit more pessimistic note. Thanks. Uh, pessimistic, but probably also very realistic, Timo. I, I, I think you're right uh, when you say we have to deal with this as a real threat. Um, I think it's important to um, it's important to not exclude certain scenarios simply because we want to remain hopeful. It's important to uh, to actively work towards maintaining a zone of peace. Mads, over to you, please. And also the positive person, uh, but uh, no, I know I agree. It's a sad picture what we see right now, especially when it comes to the Arctic Council, and and I don't think anyone predicted this. Uh, seven, eight months ago that it will last for so long. I am, however, hopeful. I, I am sure that we will see a peaceful transition of the chairmanship in May. I, I feel very, very sure about that. Uh, and I'm sure we will see some kind of projects starting up one way or another. And I actually believe that, that the Arctic will be one of the first places to start up any forms of international collaboration, cooperation with, uh, with Russia. Uh, and, and I think that comes because of search and rescue, comes because of climate research, and it comes because of the indigenous groups in the region. So it's either going to be the Arctic region or it's going to be space. I mean, those are the two two places where I see that that Russia, European, uh, Western collaboration will happen. Um, I also just want to, and I and also just just to follow up on, on Timo's note, I also think it will be interesting for anyone interested in this to follow what will happen in the Barons Council. So, 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 because Russia will take over the chairmanship of the Barents Council in October next year, and and that that that's a, for me is a lot more interesting dynamics than what happens in the Arctic Council, um, because the Arctic Council will have a chairmanship of Norway, then the Kingdom of Denmark, and then Sweden. So six years of predictable long-term stability um, in the in the in the, in the Arctic Council, and and. And then I, I, I also say, you know, we have to remember the Arctic is so much more than Russia. I know it's 60% of the land mass and 70% of the economy, but we really have to remember there's people living, you know, in Greenland, in Nunavut, in Alaska, in Lapland. Uh, and, and these people are, you know, they're going on with their lives. As I started out saying, you know, when I look outside of my window in Trumpso, life is going on as normal. So I really strongly encourage, let's not make a, a double punishment of the Arctic region and, and either militarize it or close it down as a national park. Let, let's say, you know, we need the Arctic more now than ever, and we are border towns to, to Russia. So people should please come and come to the Arctic. I mean, I will strongly encourage people to travel to the Arctic, go on holiday to the Arctic and see how it is actually peaceful. And, and see how it is actually is. So so please, you know, spend your Christmas under the northern light in the snow, uh, go on a, on a dog sledge and see the reindeers. Uh, I will strongly encourage that. And also there's a lot of investments in the future technology. So if you're passionate about the green transition, if you're passionate about battery productions and renewable energy, then go to the north, come to, come to the Arctic to work in hydrogen, to work in battery production. To, to 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 help uh, building up the region because you know if it, it can be a zone of peace but it really takes it's all about people what will what will happen here so that will be my take on it thank you some excellent comment Mads, and uh, I'm sure everybody uh, on this webinar wishes they, that they could also be looking out your window out that very same uh, very optimistic and very positive window um, thank you for that Abby. Sure, I will end on a positive note as well, because I, I do think that a lot of the, um, you know, the, the work that uh, stakeholders have done in the Arctic over the past many, many, many years is um, such a positive story in the end, right? Such a, in some ways, a model for cooperation and dialogue and collaboration. So I, I think in terms of an ingredient for 
maintaining a trajectory in that direction um, potentially for the future. Um, it, it, I think dialogue is important. Um, without you know condoning what's um, what has been been happening um, in Ukraine to Ukraine, uh, I think it is it is um, you know important to say that um, maintaining discussions uh, about key Arctic issues. Uh, you know, needs to go on into the future. I think we've, I think we've actually seen uh, um, some valuable perspectives here. Of you know, broadly strategically, we can think about these important questions, looking into the Arctic, Arctic resources, bringing them out to global markets. Uh, the Arctic is a strategic military location, but at the end of the day, it's really about you know these Arctic communities and the perspective of being there, right, and the perspective of the of the peace. Um, that is in the region and a lot of people living their lives, you know, not just in Russia, but but elsewhere as well as has been accurately pointed out. And really thinking about, you know, what makes those communities resilient into the future? What makes those communities successful? Um, and it's not there's there. They're not always the same factors. Um, you know, when we think about the strategic looking into the Arctic versus, you know, the, the uh, being in the Arctic and living in the Arctic and making a livelihood. Um, some some people, many people living traditional livelihoods in the Arctic, you know, those are really um, those are really different perspectives. And I think one of the key aspects um, of that is is thinking about how you know in the Arctic, you know, where, whereas on on the global stage there may be significant tensions and important ones to pay attention to, of course, but um, we're neighbors in the Arctic, right? And you you can't necessarily choose all your neighbors and like siblings, you know, you may love them and you may not get along with them sometimes, but at the same time, you know, there is a there is a um, history there and there is a fabric um, of dialogue there. And I think leveraging that going into the into the future will be will be very important. And um, I, I I tend to agree. I think the Arctic, um, you know, there's a lot of questions about how does dialogue and cooperation, possibly collaboration with Russia um, and other countries, you know, start resuming again at what point? Um, whatever the answer is, I, I do I do think that the Arctic, you know, is going to be a valuable um, component of that. And in fact, you know, we we are already seeing and have been seeing some of the, some some of the dialogue, maybe not in the Arctic Council per se, but in other areas. And I think that's good evidence of of exactly the points that that we've been making. So. Let's let's end on a positive note. <laughs> uh, I think that was extremely eloquent, Abby. Thank you very much for that. Um, I won't attempt to summarize, but I do want to um, I do want to make a, a few closing remarks based on what I think are some of the main takeaways, really, from what we've just heard today. Um, clearly, there are some real threats to the Arctic and in the Arctic. And I think it's important that we remain mindful of what those threats are um, and that we work actively to ensure that those threats don't turn into anything more serious. But I think that um, what the three of you have really, um, what the contribution from the three of you has really pointed out is that there's a lot of nuance. There is a lot of nuance that needs to be taken into account as we look into developments that are taking place in the Arctic. First, a nuance to do with the suspension of the Arctic Council. It is only suspended. Russia itself has not been suspended. Uh, the Council could potentially come back, uh, but collaboration with Russia could also take place on different tracks. Um, nuance with respect to militarization, uh, as Abby so rightly pointed out. Um, yes, there are, of course, uh, you know, efforts underway to look at um, how countries can better protect themselves in the Arctic, a reshapement of alliances, etc. But at the same time, it's important not to exaggerate what is happening in the Arctic and not to turn uh, um, some of uh, some of our fears into self-fulfilling prophecies by playing up the narrative of a conflict in the Arctic. Uh, similarly, nuance with respect to economic cooperation, as pointed out by Mads, um, the situation may look bad from a geopolitical point of view, but clearly economic cooperation is underway and uh, a lot of it is, as you said, unsuspendable. Similarly, a lot of nuance with respect to Russia and China. China is needed. China is in some ways an integral part of the Arctic now, and a lot of nuance also with respect to uh, uh, to Russia. So I think that um, 
I think it's a bit of a wait and see situation, but I think that obviously we, you know, we have to continue dialogues such as these and uh, we have to make sure uh, as we go forward that we reflect on instruments and ways in which we could reinforce uh, security and peace in the Arctic. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we have to continue to put our thinking caps on um, to make sure that we can all look out of the same window uh, through which Mads is viewing the Arctic. <laughs> um, so thank you very much to each and every one of you and thank you to viewers and thank you for all those questions that have come in. I think this has been extremely helpful. There will be a, a recording of this webinar that will be put up on the Graduate Institute's webpage and that will go on YouTube, um, which you can share with friends and colleagues for future viewership. Thank you very much once again.